Hello, everybody, from Daytona Beach, Florida. The event, the Daytona 500, the World Series of Stock Car Racing. This event is only eight years old, but as you can see in back of me at part of the pack stands, this event has grown so much in popularity and stature that today the largest sports crowd in the history of the South, 90,000, may be here to watch the world's fastest cars and top drivers. This is my first trip to Daytona, and I've been amazed at the magnitude of this event and the feeling of anticipation and excitement. Look at the thousands of cars in the infield. These people have come from all over to be here. And last night, they even came in and set up tents, and their uh, campers stayed the night over and were up early this morning and taking a tour, a part of this city in itself. Because here they have permanent buildings for garages, for the uh, manufacturers and accessories. They ha even have their own hospital here and cafeteria and thousands of dollars of electronic equipment for timing and photographing. And to give you some idea of the size of this racing complex, I do a lot of football on TV. I know you watch a lot of football. You can lay 17 football fields lengthwise across the infield and the width nine football fields. That shows you how big the Daytona International Speedway is. Now working with me here today, one of the great drivers of all time, Roger Ward, two-time winner of the Indianapolis 500, who also has driven here in Daytona. Now, Roger, what can we look for here today in this big event? Well, certainly a very exciting race because this is the most important race that these men will drive all year. The most money is here, over $142,000 in prize money. The winner will receive over $30,000 plus many endorsements. So they all want to win. The weather is uh, uh, a little bit shaky. We have a threat of rain in the air, and of course the wind is blowing quite hard. So this is going to make the driving very tricky. The cars run very close together. It's important to draft, and when you're running that close, this wind could be a very a serious factor. Roger, how fast will these cars be moving today? Oh, they'll be running well in excess of 175 miles an hour. Well, that's moving, huh? It certainly is. Speaking about moving, we followed one of the cars around before the race, so we could give you some idea through Roger Ward's description of the problems and the thoughts of a stock car racing driver as he negotiates this two and a half mile Daytona Speedway. Well, this is Freddie Lorenzen's car. He's approaching the starting line, and this is perhaps the flattest turn on the racetrack. You're going through here flat out at a speed of perhaps 180 to 185 miles per hour, approaching the first turn. And of course, this is where the bank is real steep, 31 degrees to be exact. You can drive in there without even lifting the throttle. It's very difficult to do at these speeds, but you can. Of course, the driver's thinking about keeping his car under control, and as he approaches the back straightaway, the bank falls away. You have to be extremely careful at this point because if you're a little bit out of shape, the car could get away from you. Down the back straightaway at speeds of 185 miles an hour and approaching number three. Into number three, and you still don't have to lift because the bank will hold you. Occasionally, the car will drift a little bit, and you can see the drift by uh, the way the back of the car is out. And around to the front straightaway, and of course, to the starting line again. Thank you very much, Roger. Also working with us today is a man synonymous with auto racing on ABC's Wide World of Sports. The publisher editor of the National Speed Sport News, the very knowledgeable Chris Economaki, will be with us working from the pits. And let's go down to Chris right now. Thanks, Kurt. Well, the most significant aspect of today's 500-mile race is the return of the Chrysler Corporation cars to competition after a one-year layoff because their Hemihead engines were banned. The speeds have gone up. The interest has gone up, the field is bigger. And we have an important man driving the Plymouth Pace car for the 500 today. The Vice President of the Chrysler Corporation and General Manager of the Chrysler Plymouth Division, Mr. Bob Anderson. Bob, welcome to Daytona. Thank you, it's good to be back. Bob, how important is stock car racing to a big automobile company? Well, I think the answer to that's evident here today, Chris. If you see this tremendous crowd of rabid race fans who are here for just one thing, see how these cars perform. We've found in the past that our cars are here whether we're interested or not. So our aim at Chrysler is to make sure that our cars perform up to their full capabilities. To help you out, must you win or is playing the game helpful? Well, it's always nice to win, but we think it's important to be here and to put on a good show. We'll be watching. Thank you. And we'll be back for the start of the Daytona 500 after this message. Now we have uh, Petty number 43 is in the pole position on the inside. 
Dick Hutcherson in a Ford, number 29. Behind them, Goldsmith in a Plymouth. He'll be number 99. Earl Bomber in a Dodge 65, number 3. They're the first four cars. They've earned their right there. They're coming around uh, turn four now into the home stretch, and there's the pace car going off the track, and it looks like we're going to have a start for the Daytona 500. They're approaching the starting line. 50 cars. The green flag. It's an official start. Well, there's a car awfully close to the wall going into the first turn. A lot of heavy traffic right now. 500 long miles to go, Roger. What's the strategy here in the early laps? Well, of course, most of these drivers will be hoping that their car performs well. Uh, still kind of an unknown thing. They'll be kind of anticipating that first pit stop. If they're going to have trouble, probably it will happen before then. Richard Petty of Randleman, North Carolina, the favorite in this race, is out in front here in the first lap. That's Paul Goldsmith Smith, that has pulled right in behind him uh, with Hutchison now in third spot and other cars for the back. Now you're going to hear the term drafting throughout this race, and we're, we're going to take a look at it uh, as uh, these drivers draft, and uh, here's one right now, and Roger Ward will explain it to you. Well, actually, drafting is when one automobile follows the other very closely, and this is extremely important at these high speeds because two cars together can run considerably faster than one car by itself. It seems as though the horsepower of the second car helps push the first car through the air. There's a vacuum formed here, Roger? Yes, the second car is actually in a vacuum. And because that vacuum is helped broke up by the second car, why the two cars will go faster. Richard Petty in the lead. Paul Goldsmith is second. Early laps here at the Daytona 500. 31 degree bank turns. The world's fastest tracks. They'll be hitting 180, 185 on these uh, straights, won't they? Yes, they will. And actually, they'll be running through the turns at 165 miles an hour. There's our first blown engine. That was H.B. Bailey of Houston, Texas. Here's the third and fourth car, Jim Hurtabies and Dick Hutchison running fourth. I would imagine Hurtabies would like to get up there with Goldsmith and Petty so as not to lose out. Now already they're lapping. There's Petty, number 43, and Goldsmith, number 99, at tremendous speeds, are already lapping some of these cars. Look at them. They, uh, the laggards are uh, almost standing still compared to the tremendous speeds here of the number one and two cars. Those cars that you think are standing still are still running around 150 miles an hour. Here goes Goldsmith on the inside. He's got a little uh, edge on Petty. What's the strategy of passing cars, Roger? Well, of course, they use what they call a slingshot down here. The car gets back a few car lengths in the draft, and then because uh, he's in that draft, he can run a little faster. If he gets his speed up, then gets alongside the other automobile, that slingshot effect should shoot him all the way by. Is it the car or the driver that pays off? Well, certainly both are very important. I think the best car makes you the best driver but uh, having uh, ability is certainly important. Here's another blown uh, engine. That's Ronnie Chumley of Houston, Texas. Well, well, this year the speeds are higher than ever here at Daytona. We asked some of the drivers if this increased speed could make this race more dangerous. Um, the way I feel about it, it will, because the uh, faster you run, the hairier the car gets and the more the draft affects it, Chris. But um, we've got a bunch of real good drivers here. They've all run here before, and I believe it'll be a real safe race. Well, uh, I would think so, definitely, Chris. Uh, I mean, as far as uh, speed concerned, the faster you go, the more danger you would have as far as uh, handling problems. But uh, it seems like that most of the drivers and the mechanics are, these years as they go along, do get better and better. Well, I wouldn't really say a lot more dangerous. Uh, the tire companies have gone way out through the winter to make a wider, safer tire with a new uh, safety diaphragm inside. The tire's about an inch and a half wider for better uh, well, holding purposes, but aerodynamically, the cars are moving around just a little bit more this year. Well, uh, no, I don't think that uh, a couple of three mile hour will make it any more dangerous because they've uh, improved the tires that much. In other words, uh, the majority of the speed that we're getting this year, I'd say come from the tires, so uh, that makes us uh, that much safer all the way around. Definitely, in the 100 milers Friday, it was uh, 
real tricky because everybody run about two mile an hour faster drafting than we ever have here, so it is definitely going to cause a lot of problems. Well, no, I don't think it'd be any more dangerous because your tire factories have come up with better tires and also the uh, manufacturer with the cars have improved the new model cars are quite a bit where they handle a lot better. So anytime the cars handle better, the cars are safer even though the speeds are up. Goldsmith still leading, number 99. That's Richard Petty now uh, taking the lead back. Richard Petty, number 43, driving his Plymouth, is in the lead here. Early laps of the Daytona 500, the World Series of stock car racing. The weather's a factor here today. It's windy. There's a threat of rain. What's the wind mean to the drivers, Roger? Well, actually, the wind can affect these drivers quite a bit, and it would affect perhaps the car drafting more than the lead car because he's in that vacuum. And it's very tricky, uh, particularly as you go through the turns and the direction of the wind hitting the automobile changes. Betty moving right along. His uh, Plymouth was banned here with a Hemi head engines last year. Here's our first pit stop. And this is quite a driver, Ned Jarrett, 34 years old from Camden, South Carolina. He's one of five drivers who won the NASCAR national title. This is not an ordinary driver here in the first uh, unscheduled pit stop. Well, he certainly is an ordinary driver, and this is unscheduled. It's a little too quick. Looks as though he's probably got a tire problem. We'll be back with more action from the Daytona 500 here in Daytona Beach, Florida, right after this message. Here in the early stages of the Daytona 500, number 43, Richard Petty out in front. That's Paul Goldsmith driving a 65 Plymouth. He's second. The two Plymouths are the leaders right now. And it looks like they're drafting. Yes, they are. Actually, you can see how that drafting works because if you notice, Goldsmith will drop back just a little bit in the turns, but actually when they get to the straightaways, he can pull right back up on the leader. Here are the third and fourth car. Jim Hurtabies is third, and Dick Hutcherson is fourth. And, and here now we have a change of leadership, Roger. Yes, we are. Actually, Goldsmith is getting by Petty again, and it's important to lead the race because there's a lot of prize money, a lot of lap prize money, and uh, these men want that money. Paul Goldsmith from Munster, Indiana, is in the lead. He's one of the most versatile drivers in the business. He likes speed, flying, and water skiing are his hobbies when he's not driving racing cars. Here's a blown engine. This is yeah. Earl Balmer. Yes, and of course, he showed a little good sportsmanship. He tried to move up out of the way of the other drivers, and that's important because with the flying parts and the oil, it could be very dangerous. Uh, this is tricky getting in here, isn't it? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, because there's so much traffic, it doesn't look as though he's going to be able to make the pits. So he'll have to make another lap around the track. Earl Balmer. There's the uh, Plymouth of uh, Richard Petty, number 43, for a pit stop. Yeah, they're changing the tires on the right side. Got a really competent pit crew. Looks like they're holding him. They're going to change the tires on the left side. This is very unusual here, isn't it, this early? Yes, it is. Actually, they must have some kind of a tire problem. Otherwise, they wouldn't be changing the inside tires this early in the race. Well, of course, this race can be won or lost by the number of pit stops that a driver makes. Now here are some of the top drivers in the Daytona 500 with their idea of the number of stops that will be necessary. I plan on four stops. I think four stops could win the race. Uh, if we run pretty hard, it'll, it'll take at least five pit stops. And uh, uh, there's no, hardly any way at all, I'd say, to, to get out of not running any over, uh, any under five pit stops because uh, uh, we'll be lucky to run 100 miles on a tank of gas, so that'll make it automatically make five pit stops. Well, I'm sure that we'll have to make six pit stops. Of course, uh, caution flags could have a big bearing on the number of pit stops that we would make, but uh, supposing we run the race under the green all the way, I think we'll have to make six. Well, we'll have to make six pit stops because we can't run between 80 and 85 miles on a tank of gas. And there goes Richard Petty out of the pits. Uh, how long does it take him to accelerate the full speed again, Roger Ward? Well, actually, it'll take him clear to the end of the back straightaway before he's up to his top speed. And even then, uh, and if he doesn't have a little help, it uh, won't be there. Here's a Daryl Derringer coming in for an unscheduled pit stop. 
And what's the matter with them? Well, I would imagine the same thing wrong with everybody else. They must be having some tire problems. Maybe they're chunking a little bit. There's Earl Bomber limping in. He's the uh, man you saw blow the engine, and he's just barely getting in. Here's our leader. This is Paul Goldsmith, who's been a national champion motorcycle driver. Six times he's driven in the Indianapolis 500. Right now, he's sailing along out in front. He's been a swimming instructor, by the way, in the United States Merchant Marine. He's lapping cars. Paul Goldsmith driving a 65 Plymouth is in the lead here in the Daytona 500. Actually, he has a very comfortable lead, too, because with Richard Petty in the pits for almost two laps, he's got a pretty good lead. There is Dick Hutcherson. Let's go down to the pits to Dick Hutcherson's wife, Betty, with Chris Economaki. This is Betty Hutcherson, wife of driver Dick Hutcherson and the mother of three. Betty, does it worry you when Dick's out there racing? Yes, it does. Doesn't show. Well, I'm nervous. What, uh, what do you think about when he's on the track? Just hope he comes in safe. How about all the strenuous business of auto racing going from town to town? Does it wear on you? I go. As, I don't go too much. I go as much as I can. It wears him out more than it does me. Would you rather be home when he's racing or would you rather be here watching? I'd rather be here at a major race. Do you, you enjoy it? No, I don't about, enjoy it. Suppose this car goes out with mechanical trouble. Then I calm down and I enjoy the race. <laughs> well, we certainly hope that you uh, don't enjoy today's race. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> Betty Hutcherson watching her husband drive in the Daytona 500. There's the husband, Dick Hutcherson, one of the top dirt track drivers in the country. Also a two-time champ at the International Motor Contest Association. Here's the leader, Paul Goldsmith. Paul Goldsmith of Munster, Indiana, is the leader right now in the Daytona 500. He's passing a great young driver, Mario Andrade, from Italy, born in Italy, who I guess is going to be a real comer. He certainly is. We'll be back with more action from the Daytona 500 after this message. Thirty-nine-year-old Paul Goldsmith is out in the lead. He's driving that number 99 car, 65 Plymouth, here in the Daytona 500 from the Daytona International Speedway, Daytona Beach, Florida. He had the fastest lap in the trials, 178 miles an hour. Here's A.J. Foyt now into the pits. This is quite an all-around driver, isn't he, Rocky? Yes, he certainly is. He's one of the greatest drivers of all time, and he proves it every time he goes to the racetrack. But he's been having trouble with his automobile, and he's not too happy right now. Boy, drives everything, doesn't he? Midget yes. Sports. Uh-oh, here's a spin. That's Mario Andretti, the young 25-year-old uh, driver. There goes the leader, Goldsmith, into the pit after Andretti has spun. So we'll have a new leader. That's Paul Goldsmith now for a scheduled pit stop. We're approaching the time now when we're having our first scheduled pit stop. What do they figure, about 100 miles per pit stop? Actually, uh, we're just short of 100 miles, and an interesting note would be that the average speed at this time is over 170 miles an hour. And now a new leader. This is Dick Hutcherson. Yes, Dick's been driving a really fine race. He was never worse than fourth, and he's driven a very consistent race and now has inherited the lead. He had the fastest Ford in trials, 174 miles an hour. Look at these tires. Yes, this is, uh, I think, probably what's been happening. The tires, because of the width and because of the tremendous speed and heat, have begun to chunk a little bit, and you can see big pieces of rubber out of the middle of that tire, and that's what caused the problem in the early pit stops. Those big tires on that tread, they really grab hold of that track, really, right? Yes, they certainly will. Here's the leader now, Hutcherson coming into the pits. Dick Hutcherson. He's 34 years old from Charlotte, North Carolina saw his wife earlier being interviewed. There's his pit crew going to work. Here comes Mario Andretti's car, and as you can see, the front end has been uh, quite badly damaged. I think he ran into another automobile, probably due to the wind or something, and has caused his problem. Got a flat right tire. Now he's starting to boil over. Yeah, I'm uh, sure that he's out of the race for that's good. A, that's a Chevelle, the only Chevelle in the race, right? Yes, and it was running quite well. Now we have a new leader and a local boy here. Marvin Panch from Daytona, Florida. He's a veteran. He, uh, a few years ago, was in a bad accident and was severely burned. He's the leader right now. Yes, that accident was right here at Daytona Beach. It was in a sports car race. 
car got upside down and trapped him inside, and he was quite severely burned. But the driver who helped him get out, Tiny Lund, took over his stock car that year and was fortunate enough to win the race. We're still working on Andretti's car. This is a boy that was born in Italy, 25 years old. He drives against Roger Ward in Indianapolis. And uh, now moving in is Freddie Lorenzo. He's a favorite of yours, isn't he? Yes, Freddie's uh, one of my favorite race drivers and a truly great race driver. However, today, I think he must ha be having uh, a little trouble, maybe too high a gear, because he's not keeping up with the leaders, and I'm certain he's not too happy with the way things are going. Do these pit crews practice uh, as a unit to, to get these times down? Yes, they do. And as you'll notice, these boys really know what they're doing. Those tires that they're handling will uh, be somewhere around 250, 300 degrees. Yeah, that number 22 is Bunky Blackburn, and he's got a blowing engine now. Bunky Blackburn, he'll be out of the race. That's a 1965 Chevrolet. Look, uh, there's something wrong here. This windshield is broken. This is Dick Hutchins. So let's go down to Chris Economac and see what's happened. Dick, you're the first of the leading contenders out of the race. What was the reason? I hate to say it because it's a little thing like a windshield. A piece of tire come off of Hurtabees' car and broke my windshield and it just started coming out and there wasn't nothing I could do about it. Oh, it's a tough break. How's the track and, the, and every, the race in general? It was good as long as I was in there. I think the Ford was really running today. And I know we'd have been right up in front if we'd got to finish the race. Well, you've got one consolation. Your wife will enjoy the rest of it. Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> Dick Hutchison, out of the race. Now the leader is going in, Marvin Pants. Now, uh, Roger, you not only have to have a great car and be a good driver, you have to be lucky in these races, don't you? Yes, you certainly do. And, of course, Marvin Pants is lucky because he's got one of the greatest crews, the Wood Brothers, in racing, and they'll do a really tremendous job. Looks as though they don't feel a tire change is necessary on his automobile, just fuel and cleaning the windshield. Uh-oh, this, uh, this is Bobby Isaacs. Looks like he's out of gas. Yes, they probably tried to uh, run an extra lap or two, and the car ran out of fuel just as he went by the starting line and had to coast all the way around and didn't quite make it to the pits. And here's a new leader now, Cale Yarbrough, number 27, driving a 66 Ford. Yarbrough from Timmonsville, South Carolina. We'll be back with more action from the Daytona 500 right after this message. The Daytona 500 roars on. Here's our leader, Cale Yarbrough of Timmonsville, South Carolina. 26 years old. He's a young driver, Roger Ward. Yes, he is a young driver, but he's certainly got a great future because he's one of the great young drivers. He's driving a 66 Ford. Incidentally, he started the racing bug at the age of 10 in the Soapbox Derby. Well, you never know where you're going to find him. Ran his first Grand National at the age of 17. He's an old-timer at the age of 26. Here's A.J. Foyt's car. It looks like he's out of the race. Yes, I think finally the trouble's got the best of him. They're pushing the car off the racetrack, so he's definitely out. Here's the second-place car, Jim Hurtabies, driving a Plymouth. Jim Hurtabies of North Tonawanda, New York, is second. And there's Marvin Panch of Daytona. He's driving a Ford. He's third. And here's the number four man, Dave Pearson, with a Dodge Charger. Dave's been driving a very good race, but here's Paul Goldsmith, who has been running in fifth position, uh, passing uh, Dave Pearson for fourth. Paul Goldsmith moving right back into contention. Well, Paul's had to make an extra pit stop, but at the speed he's running, he'll be back up there before too long. Here's the sixth car now, Richard Petty, the favorite in this race. Right now, he's running sixth. He's made a couple of extra pit stops. That's why he's back. Yes, this uh, car in the pits right now is a young Indianapolis uh, race driver uh, with a lot of talent. His name is Gordon Johncock, and he's been driving a very consistent race, not too far up, but if he keeps running at this speed, he'll be up there before it's over. Changing that left tire, isn't he, Roger? Yes, they're uh, changing the inside tires, which is unusual. And here you can see the amount of rubber that's out of that tire, and a piece like that is what could have put the windshield out of Dick Hutchison's car. 
Look at him go on those bank turns, 31 degrees. Goldsmith now is charging for third. And he's coming strong. Look at him weave. He is now taking third here in the Daytona 500. He has passed Marvin Pant. Looks to me like Colt Goldsmith's car is probably the fastest car on the track. Uh, he is handling beautifully because he goes inside, outside, wherever he wants to. So he's driving a really great race. And of course, his car is really performing too. Now let's keep repeating, Roger. He ran the fastest lap in trials, 178 miles an hour. That's really flying around any racetrack. Right now, they're averaging over 170 miles an hour, the leaders here in this Daytona 500. What about physical? Here comes the leader, Yarborough, into the pit now. A scheduled stop. Kale Yarborough. Kale's second stop, and uh, it's a planned stop. He's running the kind of race he'd like to run. However, I think probably he wishes he could go just a little bit faster. How important is physical condition with these drivers? Well, physical fitness is extremely important. Uh, it's a tough grind out there. It's more of a mental grind than physical. But if you had to worry about being in good shape, certainly it would be even tougher. What kind of miles per gallon are they getting? Well, these cars are getting on an average of four to four and a half miles per gallon. And as you saw, Goldsmith is back in the pits. And it looks like Freddie almost run into him trying to get to his pits. That's Freddie Lorenzen. And this is Freddie's second scheduled stop. He's not running as fast as he'd like to, but he's got a well-planned race. And with a little luck, he could be up in front. There's a new leader, Jimmy Herdeby, on this two and a half mile track. Earlier, we asked some of the drivers what was the toughest place on the course for them. And here's what they had to say. Well, there's no certain corner that's really tough. It's a lot has to do with it, as cars you run with and, and how the wind changes and which direction it's blowing. And if we get a crosswind, it doesn't hurt us too bad, but if we get a wind blowing with us and carrying us down the straightaway faster, it really gives us a lot of problems getting into the corner. There's only one uh, uh, difficult spot on this course uh, that uh, bothers anyone to speak of. It'd be coming off the fourth turn, there is a little hump there, and you have to manage to come off uh, off the fourth corner right when you hit the hump. But outside of that, the, this is a real nice, clean track, and it's a pleasure to drive it. Right down through this um, dog leg here in front, Chris, um, the car gets a little bit hairy there, especially if somebody passes you on the outside. Well, I believe coming off of the fourth turn, when the bank levels out to get on the straightaway there, there's uh, uh, a pretty big jolt to the car as you come off there, and sometimes it will change positions with you. When not anything particularly, uh, the the toughest part of the track, I'd say, probably would be coming off a of number four corner. There's a a real big dip, and if you don't come across it just exactly right, it can get you in a lot of trouble. But other than that, the track's pretty decent. Well, I'd say the toughest part is this diamond on the front stretch. If uh, you have the wind with you, running right a little over 180 down this front stretch, and the cars get a little light. The leader is in now. This is Jim Hurtaby of North Tonawanda, New York. Well, this is his third pit stop, and actually it's a little bit early, so, so he may be having some tire problems also. Well, they seem to be having more tire problems than they thought they would. Yes, I believe they are. Actually, some of these fellows are probably using a little softer compound and as a result are running into problems. That softer compound gives them a higher rate of speed. Blowouts are practically not. There's Jim Hurtabees who was badly burned back in Milwaukee in 64. Look at the gloves he wears. Actually, he has to wear those gloves to protect his hands because his hands were very, very severely burned. And here's our new leader now, Paul Goldsmith who led earlier the four pit stops in the Daytona 500. We'll be back with more action from the Daytona 500 right after this message. Here's the leader now as we're past the halfway mark, Paul Goldsmith of Munster, Indiana, driving a Plymouth. Goldsmith, the leader, 90,000 looking on here. Here's the second place man, Richard Petty of North Carolina, and he's driving a 1966 Plymouth. Actually, these two, these two men have been going at a truly remarkable speed because even though they've made extra pit stops, they've managed to get back into first and second place. Number three man, Marvin Panch of Daytona Beach, Florida. If he keeps going at this speed, he's in there for a good spot. However, I doubt 
unless uh, Goldsmith has trouble or Petty has trouble that he could win the race. And the number four man is Cale Yarbrough of Timmonsville, South Carolina. And here in the largest crowd in the history of Florida sports, 90,000 watching the eighth Daytona 500. Let's take a look now at the leaders. The leader right at the moment, even though it doesn't look like it, is Richard Petty because Gold Paul Goldsmith has been back in the pits for a couple of laps and has dropped back to about fifth or sixth. Richard Petty, a farm boy from Level Cross, North Carolina, where he's born, has uh, driving his Plymouth number 43 in the last seven years has won more than a quarter of a million dollars. This racing is really booming in America. And these fans here, of course, are identifying with the cars and the drivers. Here's the number two car. This is Cale Yarbrough, just 26 years old, from Timmonsville, South Carolina. He was a semi-pro fullback. Most of these drivers are good athletes. Cale Yarbrough running second. And these fans, of course, identifying as they drive Plymouth, they're rooting for Plymouth. Here's a Dodge Charger. This is uh, Dave Pearson from Spartansburg, South Carolina. He's running third right now in his Dodge Charger. So all the Dodge drivers are rooting for him. This is Freddie Lorenz, and he's in fourth position now. And, of course, Fred has been driving a good race, not as fast as he'd like to be going, but he's been driving a good, consistent race and running in a very comfortable fourth position. The race so far has been free of accidents. We've had no bad spins or collisions, and they're averaging better than 165 miles an hour. They used to run on the beach here, on the sand, wait for the tides to go out. And then in 1959, they built this beautiful speedway. And this is the eighth Daytona 500 called the fastest racetrack in the world. The France family, Bill France Sr., now his boy, Bill Jr., certainly been responsible for the boom of stock car racing in America. Here is uh, Richard Petty coming into the pits. He's had a very comfortable lead. We'll be back with more action from the Daytona 500, right after this message. Here's the third place car, Dave Pearson, into the pits. And that pit crew really hot and going to work. Yes, they are. However, I think they have decided the tires are going to be all right. So all they're doing is uh, cleaning the windshield and putting in some gas. Yesterday, Chris Economaki explained interesting differences between a racing car you're looking at right now and a straight pleasure car. This is the 1966 Dodge Charger that I rented to drive around Daytona Beach. And like all other 1966 model cars, it has such things as chrome moldings on the front and the top of the fenders, headlights, bumper guards, raised letters for the name on the hood, windshield wipers, and a mirror on the side. And of course, it's straight and level across and has a pretty nice finish. Over here, is the 1966 Dodge Charger that Cotton Owens prepared for David Pearson to drive in the 500 mile race. It has no chrome molding over the fender. It has no chrome molding along the hood. It has no bumper guards, nor does it have a raised name on the hood. The windshield wipers are missing, and so is the side view mirror. It's not straight and level, but tilted sharply to the left to put the weight mostly on the left side of the car. And the finish? like a baby's cheek compared to the finish of the stock Dodge. And underneath, the tires are a different story. Racing tires, almost twice as wide as highway tires. Under the hoods of the cars, there's a vast difference. The racing charger, a full house, a 426 Hemi head engine that's been reduced in size to 405 cubic inches. A large racing manifold supports a tremendous air cleaner. And there's hardly any room under the hood for anything else. Whereas in the rent-a-car, there's plenty of room under the hood, for that has a 383 cubic inch wedge engine with a four barrel carburetor. The difference between a racing stock car and a pleasure car. Now, back to you, Kurt Gowdy. All right, Chris, here's another car in trouble. This is Paul Goldsmith's car. Yes, I think perhaps the chunking of those tires has created a situation where probably he lost a drive shaft or a universal joint. That's the only reason I could see for him having the car jacked up. And here's a car that's blown the engine. I think that's Gordon Johncock. Yes, it is, car number 71. 
This is unfortunate. He was driving a great, a great race. But of course, this causes a very dangerous situation because aside from the parts that he might have left on the racetrack to cut someone's tire, driving through that smoke screen could be very dangerous. You can't see a thing, and sometimes at the speed they're traveling, you would go maybe two or 300 yards, and that's really quite a distance. There's the leader, Richard Petty. We're getting a real threat of rain here now. A few raindrops are starting to sprinkle. Richard Petty, who has quite a family story, and coming in here now is Marvin Panch, and he has a broken windshield. Another windshield has been broken with that flying rubber off these tires that are shredding rubber. This is very unfortunate because Marvin's been driving a great race and was in a real good spot. They're putting gas in, but I don't think he's going to go back out. That, that crew isn't hopping at all. No, they're certainly not. They know that he's done. Bad break for local boy Marvin Pant. Here comes Curtis Turner, and he's got a broken windshield. Boy, I'll tell you, they're really having some problems up. That's two broken windshields just the last few minutes, and of course, both of these cars are on the same team, so this is a real tough break for the Wood Brothers. That's uh, Hutcherson, Pant, and Turner now, all fours with broken windshields. That's right. It's possible that there have been some others that uh, we haven't caught. The leader, number 43 in the Plymouth, Richard Petty. That's uh, Jim Hurtaby. He's trying to unlap himself. He's spent quite a bit of time in the pits, and of course he's trying to make that ground up, and uh, Petty is just uh, comfortable. He wants to ride along there and keep up his speed, but uh, try to stray out of traffic if he can. He likes to ride high in those bank turns. Yes, I think the way his car is set up, he feels more comfortable in the higher groove. Traffic here. Yeah, then, and these uh, cars, Hurtabees and Betty, are coming up on this traffic. Betty has his father rooting for him. His dad won this event, the first 500. That was back in 1959. Richard Petty won the Daytona 500 in 1964. Well, he'd be the first to ever win it twice if he could hold on to this lead. And his brother builds the engines. It's a great family story, this Petty family. Yes, it is. The father has uh, built a great racing team. There goes Petty, backed by uh, uh, Hurtabees again. I see uh, Chris Economaki in the pits now with Curtis Turner. And uh, let's go right down to them. Curtis, you're out of it. Why? Uh, a tire come apart on Jim Hurtaby's car and uh, hit my windshield, broke the windshield, uh, shattered it, and I went on to run about 10 laps before it come apart, and the uh, windshield come out of it. What happened to Marvin Pants, your teammate? Uh, same thing happened. Her uh, Hurtaby's is spinning his left rear wheel, and he keeps uh, going back out. He's already knocked three fours out. Uh, uh, Hutchison and uh, Pants and mine. I'll be like Curtis Turner with a story on why he's out of the race. Okay, Kurt. The leader, number 43, Petty. Right now, the average speed, the leader, 162 miles an hour. Amazing. We've had some yellow flags and bad weather. Of course, with the number of stops they made, that is truly an amazing speed. And of course, here's Hurtaby. He's going back by Petty again. He's trying desperately to unlap himself. Although Petty has the lead, uh, anything can still happen. A broken windshield, a spin. Oh, there could be any number of things happen. There's Going a spin right there. In fact, it looks like a car lost its wheel. Who is that, Kurt? That's Ned Setzer, and look at that wheel. This creates a dangerous situation also. The cars could run over that wheel and, of course, uh, put them out of the race. Trouble in the backstretch. Just goes to show that no matter what happens uh, or how late the race, you could have trouble. Uh-oh, there's trouble on the front straightaway. That's hurt of these, and he was momentarily out of control there. My gosh, you could have wiped out the whole field. I would say probably in his effort to make up this ground, he's driving uh, uh, a little too hard, and uh, as slick as the track probably is, this situation can happen. He could get out of control easily. The leader, Richard Petty, holds the record here for a full 500-mile race, 154 and 3,500 miles per hour. And there's Petty lapping Dave Pearson now. He's two laps up on him now. Now, what he has to do is stay out of trouble, right, Roger? Yes, that would be the important thing now for Petty, just to stay out of trouble. There's this... a fourth-place car, Freddie Lorenzen. Actually, I think Freddie's in third place, uh, unless he has to make another pit stop. 
We'll be back with more action and the conclusion of the Daytona 500 right after this message. This is Kurt Gowdy again with all-time racing great Roger Ward from Daytona, Florida. The weather, as you can see now, is bad. There's a yellow flag. They're driving now on a wet track, and they slowed them down. Richard Petty is the leader. We may have a short race here. And now the white flag's up. One more lap. Petty is average. Look at the uh, weight. Actually, this is very dangerous here. This amount of water on a racetrack uh, can be very dangerous. They're running probably 125 miles an hour uh, without windshield wipers, so it's difficult to even see where they're going. Betty's going to average over 160 miles an hour in this race, but in a short race, his record will not count. The first auto race, by the way, was run on Thanksgiving Day in America back in 1895. Average speed for the winner, seven and a half miles an hour. A great comeback for the Plymouths. They were barred last year with their Hemi heads, and here they are winning the first major race of 1966, Richard Petty, who started a racing by washing and cleaning auto parts in his dad's garage. His father's won this event. Petty's about to win his second Daytona 500. He's coming for the finish line. He'll win over $30,000 in prize money. And there's the checkered flag. Richard Petty wins the Daytona 500. Certainly a great victory. In second place, of course, is Cale Yarbrough in a 1966 Ford. He drove a fine race, and sick. And third place is car number six, David Pearson, in a Dodge Charger. The race was short in two laps, 495 miles. Here's the winner now. Going into victory lane, Richard Petty, a very popular driver.